the academic papers of 50 shades of federalism and to provide a global forum for discussion on federalism, on decentralization and on related topics. The idea of the theory is, is to engage with experts, with politicians, with civil society actors around the world about questions related to federalism, um, both specifically focused on individual countries, but also on cross-country themes. The idea is to create a network of exchanges and to evaluate the different topics in detail. Today's session will focus on federalism and democracy. Usually when we talk about federalism and democracy, we think of them as good bad fellow, as concepts that go together hand in hand. You can't really have a federal system without having democracy. However, as our speaker today will point out, sometimes these concepts can be in conflict with each other. So what are the links between federalism and democracy? When do they strengthen and support each other? And when do they clash? And finally, what does this all mean, not just for the established federations from the US to Germany and Switzerland, but also for newly federalizing countries such as Myanmar, the Philippines, and many other countries in the world that are discussing federalism and decentralization. Please allow me to introduce today's speakers. Today's uh, main speaker will be Professor Arthur Benz from the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. He is a world-renowned expert on federalism and comparative politics, a leading expert on German federalism, and he was an academic advisor to the German parliament during the latest federalism reform process. Most recently, Professor Benz has been awarded the Publius Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Political Science Association for his contribution to the study of federalism and multi-level governance. Today's event will be moderated by Ms. Anja Richter. She is a, a, a resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation in their London office in the United Kingdom. Before I hand over to Professor Benz, please allow me to say two words about technical issues. We invite you to ask questions for Professor Benz um, in the Q&A box, which you find as part of your um, Zoom menu. We will collect these questions and pass them on to Professor Benz. Also note, we do work with different translation channels, so please select the appropriate language when you press interpretation and make sure to mute the original language. This channel you are currently on is the English channel, which we will be using for the presentation and the Q&A as well. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoy today's event. And with this, I will hand over to Professor uh, Benz. So uh, I think I have to start a bit again. Thank you so much, Søren, for this kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you, even if it's online. I would like to shake hands with you all, but that's not possible. I think it's good that we have the technical uh, uh, facilities to get connected. Um, I would like to share with you uh, my thoughts about federal democracy and uh, hope that we can discuss on this. Uh, these thoughts have been developed in comparative works uh, in uh, Western federal systems, uh, in modern federal systems, uh, and we should uh, discuss in these rounds whether these uh, ideas can be also 
translated to uh, uh, federalism in other parts of the world uh, where federalism is emerging and democracy is emerging. Let me start by uh, saying what uh, Søren has already po pointed out. Usually we assume that federalism is in principle good and democracy is also in principle good. And so uh, linking federalism and democracy should be also good as well. And I'm from a normative point of view convinced uh, without uh, going into the de details that federal democracies are really good ideas to organize a political system. However, when you look at how this principle is uh, institutionalized and uh, how it works in reality, we find that federalism and democracy don't uh, work uh, so uh, well together as we often assume it. Uh, we find many tensions in reality, tensions and uh, the consequences of tensions are very often discussed. Think about the debate about executive federalism, the dominance of executive, or think about the dilemma of effectiveness or legitimacy in federation, meaning that we can have uh, effective governance, but uh, at the cost of democratic legitimacy or the other way around. So we all know these uh, problems of, uh, or these tensions. However, people usually tend to believe that these problems result from, well, kind of aberration of the idea uh, of federalism, uh, of the original idea of federalism, or a deficit or a decline of democracy. My argument is that uh, the uh, fundamental problem of a federal democracy is that tensions are inherent in this uh, unique structure of the political systems. And you have to think about how to link federalism and democracy how uh, to link it in reality, how to link the processes and how to cope with these tensions, which cannot be avoided. So this is a kind of different uh, perspective uh, on the problem. To explain what I mean, let me start by uh, explaining uh, what I understand uh, of uh, federalism. Usually federalism means division of power including sharing of power, uh, but uh, most people argue that it's better to uh, separate powers in a federal system uh, than to share powers, uh, uh, at least when it comes to uh, uh, the coordination of policies between levels. Uh, this idea of division of power uh, goes uh, back and this should be shown on my second slide. Uh, uh, Søren, uh, you might be able to switch to the next, yeah, wonderful. Uh, so uh, this idea of uh, division of power and separation of power goes back to the old model of federalism, which uh, uh, appeared in the United States and Switzerland. Before that, we had many federations that uh, uh, linked uh, communities and states together uh, in order to provide uh, public goods and to pool resources. So uh, the idea of separation of power to protect le legitimacy is, uh, so to speak, historical speaking, a late idea. Later on, uh, federalism meant uh, expression of diversity in multi-national uh, federation. So uh, this means that more and more uh, federalism is uh, uh, identified with division of power and with uh, autonomy of uh, constituent units in a federation. However, when we think about uh, the complexity of uh, societies, and this uh, appeared already in the 19th century, and when we think about the fact that uh, all modern organizations are complex and not only divide powers, but they also, uh, as far as they divide powers, cause interdependence of tasks. 
so a different uh, view comes uh, uh, surfaces, which means that in a federal system which divides power in whichever uh, way, whether it shares power or whether it, uh, it uh, separates power, has to deal with interdependence of task and has to deal with uh, the issues that all tasks or, or most tasks in the Federation are multi-level tasks and they have to coordinate it. And therefore I suggest to uh, take the essence of federalism not or not only as division of power, but as coordination, uh, not as separation, but of coordination of policies between multi-level uh, between multi-level levels. Separated, separation of power uh, can be traced back not to federalism, but to democracy. And my second argument, which I uh, uh, summarized on the second slide, is that democracy as we know it in modern states, which is representative democracy, necessarily uh, requires autonomy of units which are territorially organized. Representative democracy means that uh, representatives are elected, they rule for the people, they are accountable to the people, and they are selected and have to be accountable in party competition in which their policy is publicly discussed. Accountability means that representatives have to presume autonomy for the decision that they take because only in this way they can uh, claim accountability. The second point is the congruence principle. We talk about the legitimacy, democratic legitimacy of power of governments that are responsible for many different tasks. So organizing this uh, kind of democracy, representative democracy in a modern state requires that those who are affected by political decision of a government should also be able to participate in elections and public debates. And this can only organized in a way that uh, approaches, at least approaches the, this principle in a territorial delineation of powers and people. And this is the reason why modern democracy uh, occurred uh, in a territorial state. So it is autonomy and territory concept with the, which we often linked to federalism, which are basic principle of democracy, while federalism uh, means co coordination between levels of government. The consequence of this uh, perspective, and this is a perspective which, uh, so to speak, uh, 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 covers uh, the way how uh, federalism and federal democracy works. The consequence is that actually there is a tension between federalism and democracy. And this is on the third slide. Uh, so uh, as I said, democracy is bound to a territorial jurisdiction while federalism requires inter-jurisdictional coordination. So this is something which is different. Democratic politics it includes usually executives and legislators elected by citizens and uh, working in a public forum of uh, public uh, media, opinion formation among citizens. Federal, uh, federalism and coordination in a federal system is mainly made by executive politics and it can only be made by executives because they, uh, they uh, are responsible and uh, act for governments and not legisl legislative institutions or citizens. So uh, it's uh, the consequence of coordination that uh, federalism implies executive for, uh, politics. The third point, and I think this is uh, probably important for our discussion uh, in multinational democracies, democratic politics uh, expresses not the will of peoples in a federation, but the will of different peoples those on the, at the federal level, but also those at the regional and local level of the demos and the demoi. 
and they are different even if these are the same people but when it comes to elections or public opinion formation in the context of uh, uh, community then uh, different worlds will emerge responding for, uh, to the different conditions of uh, communities or uh, societies or economic uh, economies in uh, in the federation or its uh, constitutional uh, constituent units so federalism so democracy expresses uh, difference while intergovernmental politics and coordination aims at accommodation of this diversity. So all these three arguments show that there are tensions between federal and democratic politics, which means not tensions or con contradictions between the principles of federalism and democracy, but tensions between the operation of federal systems and democracies in reality. Now, these tensions uh, could be simply avoided if we uh, centralize a system or if we divide uh, governments and separate uh, states uh, by successions. But the first version uh, uh, dissolves federalism by uh, a unitary state and the second version dissolves the federal system by uh, dividing uh, uh, states and ignoring the interdependence, which nevertheless uh, uh, exists between uh, these uh, uh, new states. So the challenge is to link institutions and processes and fe in federalism and democracy. Now, what we find in reality is that uh, linking these institutions and processes depends uh, on the different institutional uh, realization of principles of federalism and democracies. And in the world of federation, we find uh, a variety of different federal democracies. And I only want to mention the power separation uh, model uh, of the United States uh, and the power sharing federal system in Germany, uh, which are, so to speak, extreme cases uh, of institutional separation or sharing of powers, which have their uh, particular problems, uh, which you can see in the United States with the increasing uh, division uh, between uh, the Congress and the President, uh, and meanwhile also the divides not only inside the federal government, but also between uh, federal and state governments due to the political confrontation. The problems of the German system are different because uh, the problem in Germany is that Governments are closely linked in the parliamentary systems to coalitions or to uh, majorities in parliament. So uh, intergovernmental relations, which are institutionalized in different forms and which require federal and then the government to come in agreement are closely linked and connected to uh, party politics, which has the consequence that uh, uh, negotiating agreement is quite difficult and uh, we uh, always run to risk uh, to end in a joint decision trap, which means that the system does not, uh, 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 is not able to change policy in a significant way, but we also cannot significant, significantly uh, change the constitution. Anyway, what we see in Germany and what we also could see in the United States, what we can see in many other federation is that Despite these problems, despite these tensions, despite the risk of frictions in federation, they work and they sometimes work with beauty uh, to cite uh, an old uh, word uh, that uh, was used in the American literature when they deal with the complexity of intergovernmental relation. Why is this so? Well, the reason why is that in practice, uh, people, politicians, uh, those who have to deal with this tension, they find practical solution in a pragmatic way. And they realize what a series of complex uh, systems uh, uh, you, you hear me, uh, sorry. Yeah. 
that uh, complex systems uh, differentiate system, but on the way, the other way, they link systems in a way which is called loose coupling. What does this mean? Well, loose coupling, if we uh, use it in the context of a federal democracy, means that uh, on the one hand, uh, democracy is uh, used in a way that uh, executive have their room of maneuver to coordinate policies, but nevertheless, parliaments and if it exists, uh, citizens via referenda, they uh, they uh, act in a kind, uh, they uh, produce a kind of shadow of majority democracy. That means that they don't tie the hands of executives when they coordinate policies, but they have to policy the possibility to supervise executives and they do this. And they have the policy possibility to intervene in uh, executive uh, coordination if they find it, uh, it necessary. The other way of loose coupling is uh, that, so to speak, parliaments uh, organize a kind of uh, uh, platform of communication, which allows them to uh, not make uh, intergovernmental policies, but to discuss on intergovernmental policies, to share views, and to enable themselves to uh, control governments uh, uh, on the basis of a kind of knowledge what other governments are intending on uh, and on the uh, uh, on the interest that other governments might uh, use. This is not well elaborated of existing federal states, but this is something that has occurred in the European Federation. What I want to emphasize is because usually the problem uh, is focusing on uh, democratizing uh, multi-level governance, democratizing federalism. What is even more important in my view to realize a loosely coupled system is to create autonomy preserving modes of cooperation. So modes of cooperation which allow governments executive to uh, deal with interdependence between levels and between jurisdiction, but which are open to the participation and the control of parliaments or citizens. What does this mean in reality? Uh, and what I now uh, tell you is, so to speak, the result of empirical studies. This is not uh, the invention of a social scientist, but this is what, uh, what emerged in practical policy. We find, uh, intergovernmental relations based on voluntary cooperation, which allows governments to come to agreement, but in case that one government is not able to find the agreement of uh, its parliament or its citizens, it has the right to opt out. So other governments can, uh, can uh, continue with cooperation while the uh, government uh, follows the standards of uh, the other government, but it makes its own decisions and realizes autonomies. In the United States, we find waivers in intergovernmental relations, allowing individual governments to deviate for standards. In Germany, we have the right in certain policies that uh, lend the government even deviate from a federal law uh, if this is uh, allowed in the constitutions. Uh, then we have uh, cases where governments uh, coordinate by standards, though they uh, provide, so to speak, either by intergovernmental agreement or by central regulation, certain aims, goals and standards that uh, lower level governments have to fulfill the organized uh, best practice competition and in this way uh, uh, induce uh, processes that uh, governments can learn from each other and in this way more or less coordinate their policy. All this uh, requires in a federal system, uh, in a democratic federa federation, uh, to avoid a fiscal imbalance because fiscal imbalance turns interdependence into dependence. So uh, one uh, uh, one uh, 
important element of a federal democracy is some kind of fiscal equalization between uh, constituent units in order to uh, allow uh, distributive uh, justice. So uh, these are only uh, ideas how to solve these complex uh, problems and tensions uh, of uh, federal democracies. What is important, and this is uh, my last point, what is important is that we have, we have uh, to avoid perfect solution uh, of either, so to speak, uh, optimized democracy, uh, which necessarily can end in a, a kind of populist uh, uh, federal democracy. Uh, we have to risk to over-regulate the federal system in which all kinds of uh, rules for cooperation or non-cooperation are established. Uh, federal democracy requires a sort of practi practical uh, way of uh, coping with these tensions, a pragmatic way of balancing uh, democracy and federalism, sharing of power and division of power, uh, and so allow to continuously adjust powers in the uh, federal system. Uh, pragmatism always uh, is not a kind of science. It requires uh, an art in practice, and therefore uh, we have to rely that uh, in uh, practice uh, people learn to deal with these complexities of a federal democracy. Thank you so much, and I'm now looking forward to your questions and comments and critique, and are happy to discuss with you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Benz, and on behalf of the Hans Seidel Foundation, let me take this quick opportunity as well to welcome you all, including those who have joined us a little later. I'm delighted to see so many of you from all around the world and from nearly all continents. It's my absolute pleasure to moderate this part of the event, where we are also now able to discuss some of the issues Professor Benz has mentioned, but also widen the debate as well as dig a little deeper on some specific issues. I'll take the liberty and start with a few questions I myself have, but then hand it over to our global audience to ask questions. As Sören explained, please use the Q&A box to pose any questions with over 100 attendees. We can't really, or I can't really keep up with hands being raised. So please do use the Q&A box and I will try to get through as many questions as I can. But to kick us off, um, Professor Benz, in your paper that has been mentioned, you've stated that federal democracies constitute complex organizations of governments. Do you think federalist systems need more robust constitutions, setting out clear frameworks for autonomy and coordination or how intergovernmental relations should be carried out, especially for nascent federalist systems, or as you said, federalizing countries, but also for established federalist states, can or should these federalist structures be tweaked to address the changing political environments you described, so more pol polarized politics or more fragmented party landscapes? Yes, thank you. Uh, of course, the federal system needs a con uh, constitution. I think this is uh, clear because uh, whenever you have a division of power, you have to decide uh, how powers are divided. Um, the uh, issue is that uh, usually people uh, try to uh, uh, divide powers so clearly that we have in a way uh, what uh, was called watertight departments or compartments uh, between uh, the different levels. Uh, and usually um, this concept is traced back to uh, the American Constitution, which actually is uh, all but uh, clear because uh, they have many overlapping uh, uh, powers in the Constitution. 
Of course, they have a principle for the allocation of power and a principle for, uh, the, to decide uh, whether the federal government or the uh, state governments uh, are responsible. But when you look in the, into the particular policies, it's always the case that you can interpret the constitution. And uh, interpretation of the constitution as, it, as to the division of power is important because um, the decision of whether a power is centralized or decentralized affects the substance of a policy. Making a, power, uh, making a policy at the central level ends up with a different substance of a policy than uh, if you uh, decide at the uh, lower levels. Uh, uh, and uh, even if you coordinate lower level policy, the result is uh, different to a centralized policy. And we have to make a decision as to the substance of policy, whether we want to centralize or decentralize policy. And the advantages of policies uh, of, of centralization of decentralization have to, has to be decided by balancing different advantages or disadvantages uh, of um, uh, 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 the allocation of power. And this is a political issue. This is not a legal issue. So in a way, you need a constitution that uh, defines principles of allocation of power, but you shouldn't make the constitution too complex, too detailed. I think in Germany, we have a uh, tend towards a too detailed uh, constitution, probably also in Switzerland. We have to uh, maintain a certain flexibility in the constitution. Also as to the relationship between parliaments and the executive, uh, of course, uh, there have to be rules. Uh, this is a, also a matter of division of power, but uh, applying these rules in practice uh, is always a political issue, and uh, that uh, should not all strictly defined in the constitution. A constitution of a federal system, due to its, its, com uh, its complexity, needs to be flexible. But of course, it's difficult to decide uh, to what degree a constitution should be flexible, to what degree it should be strict. Uh, I think there is no uh, uh, clear answer to this. That depends on the circumstances, of course. So you mentioned it should be flexible. If I may add a cheeky question being based in the UK, where we do not have a written constitution, do we actually need one in order to set up a federalist structure? Well, the interesting point is now uh, the UK will leave the constitution, but uh, when the uh, UK entered, uh, uh, left the, the European the Union, EU. sorry. Um, so when the uh, UK entered the European Union, it in a way uh, had to deal with uh, the allocation of power with the between the European uh, Union and the UK. And so uh, in a way, it de facto uh, uh, adopted a constitution, the treaties of the European Union. And with the revolution, they also uh, have uh, to uh, establish rules uh, uh, to uh, divide power. So uh, de facto, they have a constitution. And probably uh, they have the problem that they can decide on this constitution and change the, the constitution by a single parliamentary majority, which sometimes is a majority which uh, is elected by, let's say, 45% of the uh, citizens. So uh, maybe they uh, have to think about what uh, constitution uh, should mean and what uh, they probably should write down in a written constitution when they develop further towards a kind of devolved or probably also a federal system. Since you mentioned um, electoral systems, or at least sort of the, the mode of, of voting is, is important. We had a question, um, somebody is asking, which electoral system works well with federal structures? What are the challenges or risks of the different electoral systems or are there any advantages, disadvantages? That's difficult to say because uh, 
we have a uh, well-functioning electoral, uh, well-functioning federal system with with majority uh, uh, elections, uh, according to the first past the post system in Canada and uh, Australia, at least uh, concerning the the parliament in Australia. The second term chamber in Australia is elected by a proportional uh, elections. They changed this. And interestingly, this affected the way the federal system worked because it became more cooperative. Uh, the Canadian uh, federal system, which uh, usually has a single uh, party parliament, uh, even if there is a minority government, they have one party that uh, governs at uh, the federal uh, and the uh, provincial level. Uh, so, um, in a way, they uh, can rely on a majority, and in so far, they can uh, 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 make agreement uh, on the condition that uh, they uh, usually don't have uh, problems with their majority or with the coalition which we have in Germany. The problem in Germany with a, with a proportional election is that we usually have uh, coalitions, and these coalitions. Uh, uh, create uh, the problem that uh, government is tied to coalition treaties. Uh, so uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. I wouldn't say that uh, one is better than the other. Uh, in principle, you have uh, to, uh, as, as usual in, in politics and in uh, uh, constitution making, you have to uh, decide uh, about the consequences, uh, the costs and benefits uh, of different electoral systems. Um, I think there is a certain tendency that um, proportional elections support a more consensus democracy, uh, which for instance works uh, fantastic in Switzerland, but also in other uh, countries. And let me be clear, I don't want to blame the German federalism as not working. It, it works, in my view, uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, it's, it's more the, the discussion I, uh, that, I, uh, that I'm uh, uh, criticizing. Um, uh, so um, I, I have a certain uh, tendency to, uh, towards a proportional electoral system because uh, it also is, in a way, more democratic uh, if you're uh, uh, want to make it in this, this way. Nevertheless, if you take uh, the Canadian uh, Federation, they discuss uh, electoral system since decades. It's difficult to change the electoral system, uh, but it nevertheless uh, works fairly well. You have men, you've talked a lot about Germany and obviously you, you are an, an, an expert uh, and you've been involved advising government. One of the issues we, we inherently in, uh, discuss in Germany is fiscal balance and you've talked about this in your presentation and we've had a question on this as well, asking you to elaborate a bit on this. How do inherent unequal entities with unequal resources reach agreement with the Federation and each other on relative funding levels? That depends uh, mainly on the procedures. If uh, you organize uh, a meeting of uh, the heads of governments or the Minister of Finance who are uh, accountable to parliament with uh, different uh, party political majorities uh, they have two problems. One is the problem that uh, they have uh, distribute uh, money, which is uh, in politics a difficult problem uh, on its own. And the other thing is that they uh, also often uh, run into party political disputes. And this all makes uh, compromise uh, difficult. But it can work and it usually works because it's not only that uh, the uh, heads of government uh, linked to party politics uh, and uh, uh, responsible to their citizens uh, for doing the best of citizens negotiate, but usually these negotiations are prepared by experts. And experts uh, in fiscal federalism usually uh, don't only uh, uh, look at what they 
get from these uh, bargaining games. They want to uh, implement uh, rules of distributive justice that make sense, that can uh, explain to citizens and that are plausible. And usually um, it's, it's not an easy task. Uh, usually we can uh, find agreement on the general principles. Uh, the problem usually uh, is in the details to apply these principles. And that's a reason why we find in many uh, well-developed feder federations with the exception of the United States that over time and in step by step uh, over time, they developed well-functioning uh, uh, systems of fiscal equalization that are debated uh, all the time and that are criticized uh, all the time that are never perfect, but they can work and they do work and they avoid that uh, 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 some uh, constituent units uh, due to economic uh, problems fall behind and become dependent on the central government. Uh, so uh, this is uh, indeed possible to develop. Uh, and it more or less depends that you have uh, procedures that uh, differentiate between a political level, a level of uh, administration, administrative uh, preparation of these uh, decisions, and usually always uh, also the uh, include independent experts. And you can find this in Canada, in Australia, they have developed uh, an extremely uh, equalizing uh, uh, fiscal equalization. Of course, it all depends also uh, of whether you have uh, the principle of solidarity between constituent units that is accepted, or whether you consider federalism as a kind of uh, competitive system in which uh, 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 competition uh, is the uh, only mode of coordination. We've talked a lot about the institutions now involved in this process and um, mostly about the executives and of course uh, parliament and regional representatives, but what about the role of citizens? Leslie asks whether some of the newer federations are more sensitive to the challenges of incorporating citizen involvement within intergovernmental processes, but maybe not only in newer federations, how do you see the role of citizens in established federations? That's a very good question. And I, I, I'm very grateful to Leslie that he asked the question because um, I think what I should have to make clear is that um, I talked about uh, representative democracy as the core, so to speak, of uh, the uh, democratic uh, government. That, of course, doesn't include uh, different ways to include citizens in different stages of the policymaking process. And uh, I am very well aware that there are many uh, ways to, uh, many uh, attempts to include citizens in intergovernmental relations, not only in policy making at the different levels, but also in intergovernmental relations. And there are uh, interesting cases, in particular in Canada. Um, it's, it's, I, I think it's not well developed in, in Germany, even if we, uh, of course, include uh, organized interest groups in uh, intergovernmental relations. And that's the case, of course, in many other, uh, in, a, in many other system. What should be clear is, that uh, citizens can participate in the preparation of a policy, but finally, there are responsible political actors uh, that are accountable to parliaments and citizens, uh, the electorate, that have to make the final decisions. There's never a consensus. And um, whenever you have include citizens, you, uh, it should be clear who has the final responsibility for decisions. This is... Uh, uh, so to speak, the elected government. So um, yes, of course, uh, participation is important, uh, but participation means uh, that we probably have a more effective uh, decision because uh, governments have to respond to, the, to, to what, what people say. People bring in ideas, bring in information, they, they bring in their concerns 
this is important and uh, that has to be considered by by the governments but finally governments have to decision so in a way democracy is much more complex and you can organize participation across the levels of government but you cannot organize representative democracy across levels of government that's a problem i hope this answers the question we've had one question which is more sort of asking to, to clarify uh, your your presentation when you spoke about loose coupling or in, in interparliamentary relations did you talk about the relationship between the upper and the lower house um, assuming there are two chambers in the federal system or did you mean between the federal and the state or regional parliament and if i can ask a supplementary cheeky question um what role does an upper legislative chamber play in a federalist country assuming it represents the regions or the federal states can it help to balance intergovernmental politics and the autonomy of democratic governments for example by being representative of regional executives but also being part in the legislative process on the federal level let me uh, first come to the first question. I actually mean the relations between uh, uh, federal parliament and the state parliaments. Um, uh, we uh, have in the European Union where uh, we don't talk about uh, the uh, regional or local parliament, but the member states parliament, they started to organize uh, uh, cooperations uh, among themselves in different ways, but also with the uh, European Parliament, and they evolved linkages between uh, members of the European and national parliaments, uh, which finally became uh, uh, established and organized. Probably there is a certain decline of these interparliamentary relations. They are not well developed in uh, 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 federal states. In Germany, we have an interesting uh, constellation because we have parties that, in a way, link uh, uh, parties at the federal level uh, and at the uh, lender level because uh, we have, uh, with the exception of the Bavarian, uh, no, not with the exception because the Bavarian uh, uh, Christian Democrats are also in the parliament, there, but there are parties uh, at the uh, lender level that are not in the federal parliament. But usually, uh, our parties. Uh, have representatives both in the federal parliament and in the uh, lender parliaments. And of course, inside party organization, they meet and they can communicate. And this is a kind of uh, way uh, that uh, parliamentarians uh, communicate, which means that they exchange view and that they avoid to tie the hand of a government when it is a risk and uh, uh, probably leads to a deadlock when they do this, uh, so they are much more uh, lenient in in uh, in uh, well uh, making uh, defining um, mandates for the parliament. Um, that's uh, the the clarification, which is important. Well, as to the second chamber, uh, well, I think they uh, are in general important, uh, although we have to. Be aware that uh, second chamber are quite different in uh, federation. Well, we have uh, in Canada a kind of uh, replication of the uh, House of Commons, uh, which not really uh, represents uh, provinces, but uh, kind of uh, uh, regions in in Canada, and which is not really powerful. On the other hand, we have the German Bundesrat, which uh, represents. Uh, lender governments, so the, the states by their governments, uh, which means that they clearly are responsible for uh, acting for their uh, state, for, for the lender. Uh, and uh, they are quite, quite strong and in principle could uh, defend the powers of the uh, lender government. What we, uh, however, see uh, it uh, that they not always uh, stopped trends of centralization, but uh, while sometimes uh, federal legislation is simply important, um, and uh, so this has to be also accepted uh, by the uh, lower level governments. So there is a huge variety of different uh, second chambers. 
François, Francesco, Francesco, um, Francesco, and now, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, my uh, Italian colleague, um, he argued that uh, second chairmen are not really good in general uh, in representative, representing uh, the interests of, um, of state governments. So um, this is indeed an issue we have uh, to, to, to discuss in particular when it comes about uh, thinking about the balance of uh, power between the federal and the, uh, the uh, lender or the state level. I think uh, we have to uh, have second chairmen in federation and we su should support uh, the idea of second chairmen. They uh, also are important in order to make a political system more oriented towards consensus, uh, which is always uh, helpful in a federal system. But uh, nevertheless, it can make the relationship between democracy and federalism more complicated. This is, so to speak, the other side of the uh, coin. Um, you have spoken about uh, central parties versus regional parties that may only be uh, represented in one state or regional parliament. And we've had a question on that particular issue. How can the autonomy, if I understand the question correctly, of the federal units and, and the balance between them be guaranteed in intergovernmental relations and governance matters if there is a very strong centralized party system? Yes, uh, first of all, sorry, uh, I forgot the name of my uh, Italian colleague, which is Francesco Palamo. I had so many uh, Francescos in mind, that's sometimes the problem. Uh, so um, autonomy under the condition of a centralized parliamentary system, uh, this is an interesting question. And uh, um, this is, of course, um, indeed difficult um, uh, the point would be um, could we change uh, a centralized parliamentary system uh, towards a, uh, towards a more uh, uh, well decentralized or multi-level parliamentary system um, I think um, the more the, the stronger uh, the powers uh, of the uh, sub-federal units, the stronger the power of the states, provinces, or uh, lender, the more you find a certain tendency towards uh, federalization of the parliamentary system. And uh, we even recently observed this uh, in Germany, where we uh, always had a uh, rather centralized uh, par uh, party system, although recently uh, historians uh, tell us that uh, the lender level of the parliaments always uh, had been quite influential during the history of uh, German uh, parties. But uh, the recent uh, literature tells us that with the incremental uh, decentralization of certain powers towards the lender level with the, uh, the tendency towards uh, the acknowledgement of uh, distinctions between lender or the de facto uh, uh, differences between the levels, the, the lender which we have in uh, the United Germany there had been a certain tendency towards uh, decentralization of the, uh, of the party system. And um, I think um, it's in a way, you cannot change society. Usually uh, it's society that makes a, a party system more centralized or more decentralized. The German party system evolved in the 19th century in the area of uh, industrialization and the development of a, a welfare state of the federal uh, level. And that uh, was the reason why our society and of, uh, of our party system uh, became more centralized. But anyway, um, if you have a, um, 
uh, it depends, of course, on society, and you cannot change the society, but you can change the allocation of power. And the more you decentralize powers, for instance, if we would uh, decentralize uh, tax power to the to the lender, then they would have the power to decide on, let's say, income taxes, power that uh, many uh, parliament, uh, lower level parliaments uh, have in Switzerland, Canada, United States, and on. Then we probably had a more stronger tendency toward a decentralization of the party system. We've had a slightly different question as well on federal armies. Are there any federal systems where the states or divisions of that state have their own armies, but not a federal army? So where defense is not a federal duty? Well, uh, that's a uh, question. Uh, which uh, is not so easy to answer. I have no uh, sense of any uh, state which nowadays have uh, an army. Well, they have, of course, police forces. Uh, and in some uh, states, there might be a certain, uh, 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 well, militarization of the police forces. I, I don't know it. I cannot really answer this question. I usually would be uh, careful to uh, argue for uh, decentralization of uh, armies, uh, although I have not thought about this idea. But um, I would argue that in a federal system, you always have more conflicts between different parts of uh, a society which is organized uh, in democratic uh, constituent unit, democratic jurisdiction. And if you avoid that these conflicts, uh, well, end up in uh, military conflicts, uh, that we had in the United States uh, in the 19th century, uh, we should not forget that that was at the time when the United States uh, had been a federal system, which with a division of power, but uh, a serious problem on the issue of slavery, which they could not solve, and they made a compromise. And finally, they realized that this compromise couldn't work because these slaves didn't remain in the southern states where they had to do. They moved to northern states and the northern states don't send them back. And this, this increased the conflict. And finally, they had an awful uh, civil war, which uh, was, so to speak, a failure of this uh, federal system. Um, in order to avoid uh, such a situation, I would tend to say don't uh, decentralize the military power. Uh. Well, obviously, we are having this event on a very historic day where probably the most uh, known federalist uh, state is going to the polls. Um, in your paper, I mean, in, the, in this discussion, um, we've spoken a bit about the United States already. Uh, of course, you, you've said the deadlock due to divided governments and polarized politics has led to increased conflict between the federal and the state level. And we've seen during the pandemic when the president and state governors carried out this conflict very publicly. How could this conflict be overcome? And do you think intergovernmental relations need to be more institutionalized in the US, or as one participant has said, will federalism save democracy in America? <laughs> um, probably uh, yes, because uh, in uh, the United States, uh, we have the fact that uh, the states uh, can make uh, policies in fields uh, where the federal uh, government uh, well, let's say does not make uh, 
policies that uh, can really solve the problems. Think about of uh, climate change policy where we have active states that deal with problems that uh, the federal government uh, is not really addressing. So, uh, and uh, I also think that uh, uh, American democracy uh, still works, uh, if it not works on a, a federal level, I won't go so far uh, to uh, call the United States a non-democratic system, but in any case, uh, they have uh, problems with uh, democracy. They talk about a decline of democracy, which they do not only, uh, scholars do not only discuss in the United States, but still they have the federal and the local level. And as far as I know, uh, people in the United States uh, more trust uh, their, uh, their uh, state and local democracy that they, than they trust uh, uh, in federal democracy. So this is uh, a kind of uh, way uh, that uh, democracy can be saved. Well, um, the issue of uh, intergovernmental relation, you are absolutely right. They uh, have not in the United States institutionalized intergovernmental relations because they still have a separation of power system and intergovernmental relations re uh, evolved informally, usually uh, in administration in the context of grants in aid programs and regulative uh, policies. Um, uh, I think, uh, it could be helpful to stabilize these intergovernmental relations uh, by a certain institutional framework. However, there is the risk and they cannot avoid the risk of a party politicization of this intergovernmental relation. And this is what we are currently observing in the United States. Uh, party polarization does not only affect uh, federal politics, it also affects uh, the cooperation between federal and state governments and uh, federal, state and local governments. And so there are divides also in the relationships between federal and state governments and among the states, and that's currently the problems. And that goes back to the party polarization in this political system, which is, so to speak, the not the result of recent history on the drum, it's just the result of a political system, which in a way uh, is based on majority decision, uh, where usually uh, two alternatives have to be uh, uh, decided upon. In all positions that have to be filled, they usually uh, decide by majority decision. So I think this is a problem of the general constitution of the United States, which is discussed since, I would say, since decades. Uh, the problem is that it's so difficult to change the American constitution. Right, I'm conscious we are already over time, but we've had one question raised in sort of different or similar ways from Myanmar, where most of our participants are from today. Um, and they are asking to, to clarify the difference between a, a federal democracy and democracy federal. Could you shed some light on that? And maybe to, to finish on, 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 on a sort of constructive note, um, what does Myanmar need to prepare or to do to turn on federalism? Um, well, I... I'm not an expert on Myanmar. There are experts, experts on Myanmar, and you should be careful to uh, make re recommendation uh, on a country which you don't know. So uh, I'm uh, quite uh, careful to recommend uh, anything. But uh, I want to answer the question, of course. Uh, the question was uh, federal democracy or democratic uh, federal. I wouldn't argue for the one or for the other. Um, the problem is to balance federalism and democracy and to balance this in uh, a situation where you always risk to run into an imbalance. An imbalance would be in the dominance of executive in uh, 
federal uh, intergovernmental relations or uh, an imbalance would be a centralization. Uh, and an imbalance would also be, so to speak, a populist uh, politics where you expect uh, all from, uh, well, uh, decisions of parliaments or, uh, or, uh, or uh, voters. Uh, you need to balance uh, both sides, federalism with division and sharing and coordination of powers and democracy at different levels, including to uh, repeat uh, different ways to include citizens in processes of participation uh, in the development of uh, individual policies. Um, so it's not uh, one or the other, it's always the art of keeping the balance between both. And that's probably not uh, a satisfying answer. I, I'm well aware of uh, this, but uh, this is, so to speak, a problem like squaring the circle with a ruler and a, a, a drawer, which is uh, in principle impossible, but you have to solve it often in practice. And that's the reason why we have to uh, hope that uh, politicians and citizens uh, learn to deal in a pragmatic way with this uh, challenge of balancing federalism and democracy. Well, thank you very much, Professor Benz. I'm afraid we are running out of time, but the good news is this is only the first session in a series of seminars we are running, so there will be future opportunities to discuss some outstanding questions and I'm really sorry to those participants whose questions I could not put to Professor Benz but we will run our next seminar on the 24th of November federalism and conflict resolution so we'll be able to pick up on on some details we we haven't been able to discuss I know there were some other specific Myanmar questions as well but do click on the Facebook page and other um, places on, on Twitter um, where we have advertised this event. And again, thank you to Professor Bentz uh, for your insights and for answering so many different questions. Um, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the evening, afternoon or good morning to the US or down in South America. And I hope I see you at the next event. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.